Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are here. The first part of the work session is going to be dedicated to some stakeholder discussion uh, about the Maryland Stadium site selection analysis. And I have name placards up here for people like, like Jim Kercheval and Dan Spadden and Paul Fry and Greg Snook. And who's over there? Paul. Delegate Quarterman. Yeah. So please come up and take a seat where your name plaque is. Be part of the discussion. Find your assigned seats. <laughs> I don't have enough room around the table for everybody. Uh, sorry. But. Copies of the study are over there if anybody needs them. Yeah, we have copies of the study. We have a PowerPoint of it. Uh, if there's any... Uh, Anybody who wants one or wants a PowerPoint, how, how long? Something like 10 slides, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. If, through the, if through the discussion anybody wants to pull, the, uh, pull up a slide from the presentation, I've got the clicker so we can move to that particular point if we need to. So anyway, I'll kick it off since it seems like the... Oh, well. So um, anyway, council um, have uh, uh, advised me to try to put together a group of people who can speak about the benefits of um, uh, a facility that, that can do many things besides just baseball. And um, they'll hear from the stakeholders who are involved and people who will be involved in this project uh, and um, to get input and any questions that the council may have. Um, Dan, you want to you wanna kick it off? Uh, sure. I'm not exactly sure where everyone's comfort level is. Are there specific questions about that? Well, I thought it was important to get everyone together to discuss location options and then also just kind of get and figure out what is our vision for this and how do we make sure if we're going to do it that we make it successful. And I think all of us sitting in the same room and, and coming up with that shared goal and vision is important. So that's kind of where I'm at. Well, I draw my inspiration from looking at other cities that are similar to ours, uh, the problems that they face. Uh, the people who coined the term Donut City, which that really resonated with me because that's exactly the way I, I looked at our, our city and how if you put this level of development and investment into the, into the donut hole, it closes the hole up forever. Uh, so you have a vibrant, walkable, sustainable downtown where young and upwardly mobile people want to live and we create uh, a new generation of, of uh, city residents you know that are gainfully employed and, and uh, into the whole sort of arts and entertainment education vibe that we're building there. Uh, I'm also into it for the image of the city uh, seeing what other towns have done with their their uh, multi-use facilities and how they've marketed them and, and how that's just been a boon to, to tourism. Right now in the state of Maryland, there are three major tourism infrastructure pro projects going on. Two are in Cecil County, Great Wolf Lodge and the Equestrian Center at Fair Hill, which got a ton of state investment. This is going to be a five-star equestrian center, one of only two in the country. When Great Wolf Lodge learned about the equestrian center's plans, they changed the plans and added rooms to their, to their hotel. So that's two out of the three. The third one is in a town of Williamsport, the relocation of the National Park Service headquarters. So three major tourism infrastructure projects in the state, both owned by rural counties which is amazing. So I'm impressed by our tourism numbers. We're growing strong arithmetically each year. But if you want to 
if you want to reduce your doubling time from 40 years down to 16 or something like that, you need an infrastructure project. project. You need a new product to sell. So we'll have a new National Park Service headquarters and visitor center. And on the tail end of that, I'd like to have a new multi-use facility downtown to keep it coming one after the other, just to drive that industry you know, to its full potential. Uh, I'm also into that vision of that for the jobs it creates, because a modern minor league ball stadium would employ about 20 career people. It would employ another 15 or so long-term seasonals and 125 game day employees. Now, if you're raising a family on Locust or Mulberry and you have a teenage kid, what a great thing for you for the summer. They can walk or ride their bike to work, participate in something positive, you know, contribute to the family's income, feel good about themselves for, for working. It's hard for city kids to find summer employment, especially when the family lacks transportation options. So I'm, I'm looking at all these things. And th that's kind of my vision. And uh, changing our economic development model from attracting, attracting businesses downtown to attracting customers. So instead of recruiting a new business and, and fearing that it would fail after 18 months, let's put a half a million people on the street in the city's court and watch how businesses just pop up organically. Focus on that as aspect, aspect of economic development, attracting customers. And that is a compliment to the brave people who've already invested in the downtown. I mean, that is something that they would really appreciate us providing for them. That's my vision. Thanks, Dan. I think kind of building off of that, um, we were at an event yesterday, and uh, Donnie Stalemar from Waysport, town manager, talked about how they're going to do a um, ribbon cutting here of the CNO Canal Aqueduct, and then at the very same time, or they're going to do a, a opening of that and at the very same time do the ribbon cutting for the National Park Service. So they're basically completing one long project and they're right away going to bring everybody in to start another one. You know, when uh, this came back and talked about the three top sites being the downtown core, that sparked our interest because we're looking at an urban improvement project that's going to come, you know, be finishing up in 2020. And, you know, the opportunity to start another urban improvement project too, to kind of follow that and build on that momentum has value, you know, where can our organization help with that is trying to, you know, match up some of the private development that you could put around that. If you put, uh, you know, if you're looking at a couple public projects, which are always part of public and private projects as part of the urban improvement project one, you'd have the same thing here. You have a multi-use event center, you have a parking deck that you all have been talking about for a while. Uh, if you decide to go with the, the site on Baltimore Street, the county's gonna have to move, so there's another public building that's going to have to be done. So then what can we help match around that and talk to the developers in the area that are interested in to help bring some other investment into that area and help improve your tax base? Um, you know, there was a lot of interest last time uh, circulating the, you know, the last decision on, on the project in that area. Um, and that's something we wanted to do, uh, want to try to help with. Another area that we kind of like, and, and this really was one of the stats that came out of the old Ripley report that really wasn't talked about as much, but stood out to us is, you know, we believe a vibrant core of any city or town uh, is something we want to support. We support Williamsport's work as much as we are supporting Hagerstown or Boonesboro or anywhere like that. Um, you know, part of what we've tried to see if we can accomplish for years is how do we diversify the housing stock? We have a concentration of low-income housing. How do we mix that up a little bit? How do we draw new people into the core? Uh, when they were viewing the sites and they were looking at some data, they had a lot of very good uh, specific data for Greensboro, South Carolina. And in one of the charts and one of the paragraphs in that study, it talks about the change in the makeup of the accessible, accessible base that happened after their event center was put in the core of Greensboro. And they saw the residential component jump up 10, 12, 13%. I don't remember what that was off the top of my head. But when you looked at the breakdown, the, the amount of residential development that contributed to the base was up 10, 15%, saying that there's more investment or more people moving to the area, the values of the residential properties are going up. 
Um, by having that diversified housing stock, it benefits things like our arts and entertainment district. If you remember, there was a, a study done several years ago by Annabon Basu that talked about, you know, number one, you know, how Hagerstown has such a, a large amount of arts and enter entertainment infrastructure that probably shouldn't be here when you're looking at the demographics. But he did say, you know, one of the hurdles or things we need to overcome is that diversifying the housing stock around that area. How do we bring in uh, spending uh, walkable wallets is a term a lot of people use, like Dan said. How do we bring those customers and people who have some of the investment that can invest in the arts and infrastructure that we have? You know, and the last part I think I'd, I'd bring up is, you know, when we're looking at trying to bring new investment in things, you know, what are the incentives or what are the opportunities out there? And right now the hot thing on the market is opportunity zones. That's the big thing that everybody's talking about and trying to take advantage of. They have a you know limited window. They were a 10-year type of, op of thing that was put out there. It's down to seven or eight years now that you have to do that investment. Um, but that could open up a huge amount of outside income to invest in these projects that could go downtown. Now, they don't go into the public projects as much as the private projects around those. But if you pull up the, the um, Maryland website right now on that, you know, it has three projects listed. The Artopia building, the office building is there. I think the old Y is listed as well as I think the Discovery Station building is listed. But as possible buildings for investment, I'd love to see that site fill up with another dozen or so projects that a combination of local developers or, you know, outside people could kind of come together, bring investment, and put money into that area to help support this project. So those are the, the things that kind of caught our attention and why we want to support it. And, and you know, once, once the council, it's the council's decision, of course, to pick which site or what they feel is best. But to help pay for that and help cover it, you're going to need the private investment around it to help build the tax base and generate the revenue to cover things like this. So that's where we kind of see our role to helping out. So good segue to the private sector and the tax base. Uh, you know, I, about a month ago, I did some research for a centennial for the chamber. And some smart person saved probably 100 newspaper articles from 1918 and 1919 about why the chamber started in Hagerstown and what the, the drive was. And the initial drive was to promote the private sector to uh, strength in numbers. But the folks organizing it quickly determined within a few months that it's really about community as well. And community vibrancy, and they talked about education and health and arts and entertainment back in 1918. And back in 1918, the vibrancy of downtown Hagerstown was listed as one of the main reasons. And so over the years, again, a lot of people save research and newspapers. Um, the chamber and the business community was very involved um, with community. Uh, 1926 helped the Alsatia Club start the Mummers Parade, which is still going on today. 1931 uh, started a health program um, initiative. In 2018, we're involved with Healthy Washington County. We have a pilot program, one of four in the world here in Hagerstown. Um, 1935, started the JC's Club. That went away. Now we're doing Young Professionals. Uh, 1958, the first back to school program. Now we're doing On Track Washington County and, and also Teacher of the Year. Uh, during World War II, collaborated to start the Community Chess, which is now the United Way. Um, 1961, held the Chamber's first training institute. Today we hold learning lunches. And in 1961, raised 188000 for the first industrial foundation and now chief is existence actually is in our building as office space. And so we're looking at 2019, and it's a perfect match, we think, for the business community, really about community and the private sector to work together about this uh, multi-use event complex, whatever we're calling this, downtown. And it's really about continued diversity and enhancement of jobs and amenities. Uh, we, want, we have a good diversity of jobs here in Washington County and Hagerstown, but we need to continue to attract diverse economic development and jobs. And we think this can help uh, this downtown complex, whatever its name is. And as Jim alluded to, uh, maybe an urban improvement project too, that we can all work together as, as a community, uh, public sector, private sector, nonprofits, to help drive the community forward for the next 20 years. And so that's why we're interested. Um, there is support in the business community. Um, I didn't bring it with me, but back in 2012, um, there was a full-page ad that was taken out in the paper with lots of businesses supporting this initiative uh, for investment and also for jobs. So we're excited. Um, I think Jim Andor 
Dan mentioned this. You know, it's, it's not about who's right, about it's what's right. And we have such um, power in this community to work together. And just for example, look at the Maryland Theater and Barbara Ingham School, what's going on downtown. Work with city, county, state, the private sector, the public sector. And so I think it's only limited by our ability to think innovatively about how we can make this work and really for the benefit of the community. So we're excited as a chamber and as a private sector uh, to help be part of this solution, really. Anybody else have anything they want to add from the people at the table? I, just, I, I guess the one thing that I think we need to be, make sure this field is, or this area has a multi-purpose, uh, that it can hold more events than just the whole game. Now. And I think that would help Dan and help hopefully attract you know, more conventions. Uh, so, I mean, that's one reason why I've looked at it. I think it would also help the city then maintain a longer term lease. Whoever the owner may be, whether it's a current owner or a new owner, um, make that a little bit more attractive. I bought something along I wanted I wanted to distribute. Uh, just to give everybody some comfort with a project like this. Since 1987, a new minor league ballpark has opened in this country every year. Since 1987, without fail, without one year of taking off. In April, three brand new ones opened. Uh, people say these aren't good investments. People say they're not worth it. But the level of investment in these facilities is amazing. Not because they fail, but because people turn to people who came before them and say, how did it work for you? And when you get a lot of positive feedback, you, you buy into a, to a project like that. Uh, it, it's, it's incredible what's going on around, what's going on around the country. And, um, That's a heck of a streak. In one year, they opened 10 ballparks. In one year, opened three last year, this year. There's three being constructed right now, so the streak will go on. They'll open three more in April of 2020, unless one of them's late. Then they'll easily have one in 2021, but I don't know who else is building at this point, so it, it's going to happen. Um, so what I, what I want to do, and I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks, is uh, set up a peer-to-peer, -peer, an invitation for a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with a city administrator in another city, with a, a city engineer in another city, with council members and mayor to mayor, and learn from their experiences. You know, how did your community succeed in doing this? What are the results that you, that you're experiencing? And I think that more so than, like, you're probably tired of hearing me talk about it. So let's get online, and, you know, with some city leadership in other towns, and let's talk to them about it. So I'm going to be sending out invitations in the next couple of weeks. I'm just going to put well, who's on deck, what time, here's the login number, sit and have a facilitated conversation about uh, how this other city worked through this and how they made it into a big success. So. I'm hoping you'll have the time and, um, and the interest in doing that. I, I certainly do. I'm going to do it. And I, I'm hoping you guys will participate. Uh, I'll try to make it as easy as possible. I won't be flying you to Greensboro. I'll just put up a conference call number and you can log in for a half hour and meet somebody who sits in a chair very similar to yours in another city that has a thriving downtown where they did not once have a thriving downtown. And we'll learn how to get from A to Z through their sharing their experience. I just feel like we're already moving toward a thriving downtown. I mean, we need, a, we need more, but there's $60 million going into our downtown right now. And that it's bringing investment and bringing businesses and, and the tide is turning. I mean, I understand in 2012 there was absolutely nothing going on. So it's, but it's a different environment now. If, if the school system and Barbara Ingham and Maryland Theater, all these things are happening that are bringing this here, 
are we focusing our attention on the wrong area? I just, and this, this particular location that has been pushed for so long is now, there's a county building, there's so much that's already there that we would have to buy, and those people aren't even at the table. So I guess I'm, it's strange to me that we would be studying a location and we're saying we're gonna buy up all of these properties and those people aren't at the table. And it just doesn't seem like good business to me. I mean, where's that money coming from? And are they even willing? So is your concern, forget the money for now, just forget it for now. Is your concern doing this project or a project or anything? Because, you know, by a former boss would say you're either moving forward or backward or not standing still. And so one thing is uh, building on a momentum. I mean, true, we have uh, Barbara Ingham School, Maryland Theater, limited folks coming in. I mean, this, you know, if we're looking at a complex that we're talking about, generally speaking, you enhance and in, enlarge the stakeholders and the folks who will be visiting, mm -hmm. for example. So I think the project is a great idea. I think the project is a great idea. I just want to make sure it happens this time. And so <laughs> it's, I don't know the best location for it. I think we should have a conversation. I think we all have different ideas there. I just... We have to go about it the right way. And like I said, I'm not opposed to the project at all. I think I, we all know we need a new baseball stadium. They can't continue to play there. But I think that they need to be, the Hagerstown Suns need to be involved in that conversation. And if we're looking at taking that county building and a car wash and a, a laundromat and all this stuff, that's a conversation we need to have with them as well. And, and like I said, I just don't with, with, I don't know if we can gain the community support for that exact location with everything else going on. My understanding is the next the next step would be to do that investigation, is to invest the money that states provided us. That's my understanding, I might be wrong, that there's no commitment. You know, if you do that, we have the money. The analogy I use, maybe it's a good or bad analogy, it's online dating, you're going on a date and someone else pay for dinner. <clears throat> And guess what? You don't like each other, so you go your separate ways. And so I, that, my understanding is the next phase is to take the next step without having to say we're going to pick a site, you know, to gather the information, to gather information from stakeholders from the, the community. So that's my understanding, and I might be wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to chime in just real quick here because I just received this email from Randall Simpson, uh, who was WLR, and we know that. Uh, hey, Bob, Chad and I greatly appreciated the time you and Dan gave us this morning in outlining, outlining your vision for the new downtown stadium. As you are aware, we have made a large investment into the downtown area over the last five to six years. In addition to the auto spa, we have 75 residential rental wow. units along with a dozen commercial spaces. WLR Automotive Group is more than willing to work with Hagerstown in making the new stadium a reality. Since our location on 32 West Baltimore Street is vital in making this deal happen, I will commit to working through the details of relocating our car washer somewhere else in the Hagerstown area. It is very rewarding to work with visionaries like you and Dan. Hagerstown will look back at this project 10 years from now and be proud of the economic growth that it ended up creating. Thanks, Randall S. Simpson, President and CEO of WLR Automotive Group. Um, you know, I. I hear things like, you know, the, we have to buy the county building, and, 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 I, and, and I look back at the Urban Partners plan, and the plan calls for residential uh, in the area where the current county uh, permit building is. Uh, and I have to wonder, did when, when that plan was put together, did we go to the county as a city? and say, listen, we're going to put residential over here. Are you guys okay with us doing that? Are you going to give us that building? Are you going to sell it to us? Or what are you going to do? I'm pretty sure the people that I've talked to said that conversation never happened. So, yeah, it is, will something have to happen there if that site is chosen? Sure it will. Of course it will. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, 2012, the guy in the laundromat was, you know, more than willing to sell. Don't know if the guy who owns it now is or not. I have no idea. We haven't got to that point yet. In 2012, uh, the Herald Mail was more than willing to give up parking area uh, for this project. You know, so I, again, I, I don't. You know, I think we have a cart before the horse scenario, where we're, we're trying to figure out everything. 
when we haven't done a phase two that says yes or no, a facility can even go there. But we've done a phase two before. We know what phase two is going to say. I, I just don't. Well, hopefully phase two <laughs> says something different this time, and hopefully it's much more I just want advantageous to, to the city of Hagerstown. What's different this time? That, this is where I keep going back to. What is different this time? So how do we ensure that this time doesn't end up like all the other times? And in that, that location as well, we have a cultural trail that is bond financed and has 19 years left on bond financing. So we can't rip it up. I mean, I'm, that was, that's going to cause even more issues. Those are conversations that we should be having, and we're not. So what are we, I know, I know you've said we can incorporate the cultural trail, but looking at the plans, it, it doesn't look that way. So we just spent a million dollars to rip it back up. The plan is from 2012. There wasn't a cultural trail there in 2012. That wasn't even thought of in 2012. So, yeah, there would have to be a new design to make it all work. But again, once again, cart before the horse, we aren't even to that point yet to make a decision whether we want to do something of that magnitude or not. And I, I travel for minor league baseball, and, and I have for years, and when you go into another city and go to their ballpark, it is the, the crowning jewel in the city. Beautifully appointed, well-landscaped plazas, well-lighted, beautiful ingress. It's the pride of the community. Uh, and then go look at ours now. Uh, it does not present very well at all. So the, to me, the cultural trail is an asset. I think the, I think the study said it was an opportunity. Uh, think about the visitor experience, the visitor impression. They park in the A&E district uh, parking deck or the, or the university deck and take the cultural trail to the stadium gate. And when they go home, what are they going to say about Hagerstown? Wow, does that place have its act together? It was beautiful. You should see all the public art, all the cool lighting. Uh, so yeah, the cultural trail. Um, think Utah Street, the warehouse at Camden Yards. It, it's an asset. Give an architect a 40-acre grassy field, and you'll get a cookie-cutter ballpark. It'll have no character. Uh, give them a tight spot. Give them a challenging site. And what you'll get is a, a massive dose of innovation where the ballpark is such a cool feature. People come to see it even when it's not game day. Because, hey, I'm not close. i got to see this ballpark. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, you want to expose people to the arts and, and, and to the art museum and to our beautiful city park. Put a quarter million people through that ballpark on a trail that leads them for less than a half a mile to all these other amenities. So I see it as a, I see it as a really positive asset. Uh, in Fort Wayne, the concourse of the ballpark is 360 degrees, and it's part of a downtown walking and hiking trail. And when you leave your office at lunchtime to you know, put in a mile, get your steps, you walk right through the ballpark, down to the end and come back. It's, it's, it's very seamless. Uh, it's considered a public park. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm excited that the cultural trail is there and I, I think it's gonna make the whole visitor experience just that much better. Jim, okay. um, you had mentioned the Opportunity Zones and of course all three of the sites that were chosen by the MSA are in the Opportunity Correct. If I'm not mistaken. Do you think that if we didn't put a stadium there and we chose another location, just let's say, do you think that, um, I mean, we have incentives, there's opportunity zones. Do you think that businesses and development would still be happening even without a project like this? Well, I, th I think things happen, but you've had the opportunity zones for the last two years. Okay. So what, where, what's generated it over here? I mean, you need something that really grabs the attention of investor who's running opportunity fund zone fund somewhere else, doesn't know anything about our area, but he's looking and says, what's drawing my attention to look at Hagerstown, Maryland, when I live in Florida and want to put my money somewhere? Well, you start building the, the momentum around a project like this, it's going to gather national attention. There's a lot of different baseball 
of periodicals that are out there that are submitting it, it gives you that edge to pull it, uh, pull those people in. And, and the thing is, you don't have them coming in here right now. Those three sites have been there for a while. Um, you know, we have to, you have to reach a critical mass to generate that kind of interest. And we're moving forward, and I think it's great what we're doing now. You know, I would, I would say back in 2012, there was more going on than nothing. I mean, we, we, you know, that was coming after the end of my term as commissioner, but we had a variety of different projects. The USMH, the USMH had finished. That was kind of getting going. There was some development that followed that. There's been a, a continuous set of big projects downtown that are slowly building us up to where we're going to reach that critical mass where it is going to bring in a lot more, I feel. Um, back, one of the first things I did when I was came to this job is with our group, we looked at a Brookings Institute study that looked at, I forget how many it was, it was like 24, 40 different cities that had revitalized, that had really turned things around. And they tried to say, here's, here's the 10 or 15 steps to be successful and do that. One of those steps talks about the need to focus in a smaller area. You can't d dilute your investments all around because if, it's, if they're not in a f targeted, focused area, you're not going to get over that, that hump. Um, the, the other thing it talked about is how, you know, when a, a downtown revitalized, you know, there, there might have only been, you know, 30 percent public investment out of that 100 percent that happened over 10 or 15 years, but all that came in the first three or four years. They had to pump a lot of money into it early, and then they hit the mark where the private investment followed. When you look at the 10-year span, it was a nice ratio to say public to private and how we, we brought this up. But the public had to be the pioneer and step in early. I believe it was the Rockville mayor who talked to us at Mako. It was the same thing down there. They, they put in some huge amounts of money you know, to bring in some big, back at the time retail was growing, but they brought in the Gap and some other places in Rockville, and he put a huge amount of incentives and cash incentives that brought those anchors in. Once they got to that point, Rockville took off. They had a lot of crime. They had a lot of other issues. It's not that way today. Um, so, you know, our thought is, you know, and, and you guys got to make decisions on where that site is, but our thought from my perspective is you need to focus the resources where you're already going. You have, you have USMH, which is around the corner. We did that. You followed it up with Maryland Theater, Barbara Ingram School. We're doing that. We have Mark going up the street a little bit with USMH. We're doing that. Naturally, what's the next step? It should be in that area focus it in that area um, you know will we support something in another place absolutely you know I mean will we try to help out where we're, we're here to make this community better whatever that means so but you know if you're asking my advice based on what we looked at you focus your incentives down into into a focused area build you do block by block it happened in Federal Hill around Baltimore in the Orioles Stadium it's happened everywhere you go you take a block you get it going you go to the block beside it you get it going you go to the block beside it um, you know as far as having some private investment in different areas you do and that's great and we need to you know celebrate that but you know from me talking to some of my members that have different projects or things they see this as a real game changer in the market where they're going to escalate their investment in their properties or they can move things forward. It's going to happen. If that goes to another site, you know, that doesn't mean that won't happen, but it may not happen next year. It may be a 10 year plan instead of a two year plan. What we're, we're hoping to do here over the next several weeks is try to look, identify those people, those possible investors and ask them, what would this mean to you? What does this directly mean to your plans? For investment so that you guys can kind of have that information as you're making a decision on what to do to move forward Luke. we know if we go here this is the projects that feel that they're going to be able to be successful because the market you created is enough to make it successful barnwood books is sitting on the corner that's been there there's no plan for that you know yet artopia you know has been now for what four years there's no there's no buyers for that yet um, the residential development along that part, which is a big part that we were hoping, I think the, the trail would spur. There's no buyer for that yet. So we need to do, we need to pump in more. Luke. Um, I have a different perspective, I think, than maybe some of the other council members. Uh, first of all, some of us are old enough to remember the phrase uh, when you got up and left the 25 cent movie, when you would say, uh, this is where I came in. 
Okay. For those who for those who don't know, you used to go to the theater, <laughs> and, and, and you'd buy your ticket, and you'd go in no matter where the movie was, whether it was in the middle of the movie, and some movies, the horror movies, wouldn't, wouldn't allow you to enter in the last five minutes of the movie, so you couldn't see the ending. Uh, and I, I feel the same way. I sort of want to say, uh, when we get to where I came in, please let me know, okay? And and I don't say that sarcastically. I do have some comments about this. Um, unlike others on the council, I agree with the location. Um, I did go through this seven years ago. Uh, and you talk about not having to fly Austin to North Carolina. The mayor flew to Phoenix. Uh, and uh, I've often said with people who think that was a joy ride, he flew out on one day and flew home the next day. Uh, no joy ride was it. I um, I did everything in the end except make a total jackass out of myself with our $15 million uh, anonymous donor who didn't want to be identified, but who we wined and dined and went to the bankers with and everything else until we found out that, that was just something that we never figured out. Um, meaning I was a strong supporter of that. We went through the studies. I mean, Ripken studies sitting there, I understand that this is a study that has to be done in order to get the right financing. I, I have no problems with that. I have no problems with anything. And I, I totally agree with what you all are saying about downtown improvement. I mean, candidly, this is the same argument about location that we had with the University of Maryland with a great amount of people arguing it needed to be out at HCC. And I can tell you two city council members felt that way. I'm not going to name names, but I was called on Thanksgiving weekend over to a councilman's house to be the third councilman to sign a letter to the governor saying we wanted at HCC. And I said, are you nuts? Because they thought for the university, they thought it would be better at HCC. And I never argued that. <clears throat> I never argued that for the university it may be better at HCC. But for Hagerstown, it was better downtown. I have little doubt in my mind that a stadium right off the interstate in various locations that many people have identified would be a much better stadium for the Suns. Probably get easier to draw, do a whole lot of things. But if you're going to put it out there, don't ask me to give any money for it because it's not going to do anything for Hagerstown. They're just going to do something for a baseball team. It may help the county out, and then they need to fund it. And, and I totally agree with what you're saying. You put a baseball stadium not close to downtown, not close to our park, not close to the museum, and I agree with what you're saying, Dan. You architect it, architecture it correctly, and it would be beautiful. But that leads me to where I came in. And that is until you can get, Paul, I mean, we've been told over and over again by anybody who will speak from the state, and appropriately so, that the funding paradigm for a stadium in the state of Maryland is a third state, a third local, and a third private. Seven years ago, we had the state committed. We had the county committed. We had the city committed. We had a $15 million phantom donation. We had people in Phoenix who acted like they were interested in doing something other than getting paid. We had other groups come in and spend hours with us uh, under the premise that they were gonna come in with the financing and their financing was give us the money and we'll run it for you. We had every developer in the world saying just what I'm hearing. You build this stadium, baby, and we're, we have it right now. It's already been in the paper. If this stadium got built on that site, there is little doubt in my mind that Dagmar would eventually turn into a boutique hotel. How much money is it worth to have the Dagmar become a boutique hotel? A lot, but not $15 million, and of course, in my opinion, that's minimally the third local cost, which the city would not bear all that, okay? But we need private investment to come in with that third. Seven years ago, 
It wasn't that we couldn't get the 15 million. We couldn't get a nickel. I mean, we couldn't get five cents. We couldn't get one private investor to even mention an interest. The Maryland Theater. I do not believe the Maryland Theater would ever be where it is right now if it weren't for the Hamiltons. It wasn't private money that kicked that Maryland Theater off. It was private investment. It was the grant from the Hamilton Foundation. And suddenly other people started jumping on. And then you got governments involved. Now, one thing is for sure. There's a little doubt in my mind that every time we even mention talking about a new stadium, the value of the Hagerstown Sun increases in value. There's no doubt in my mind that if we broke ground on a new stadium, that the value of the Hagerstown Suns would go up exponentially. Pass that down the roof for me, will you? Just so he Thanks. sees that. You know, when you say that there was no private investment in 2012, and regardless of the $15 million mystery man or not, we had a, a commitment from the owner which is private investment of six million dollars. So there is private investment in, in this that, project. That was I, listen. I I'm, I I don't want to get into debate, Bob, about about that whole issue. But that also involved. Let, let's be clear on this. Nobody is given money without naming rights, mm -hmm. and, and that investment involving naming rights, and those naming rights would have been sold by Bruce Quinn to someone else. So we could have sold naming rights. I, I understand what you're saying, and I really well, I was think talking about the lease. I wasn't talking about naming well, rights. Uh, uh, because there's, there's different ways to go about funding uh, this, I, I, which I, is another thing that can be shown I'm an absolute, out of phase two. Bob, uh, listen, I'm, I was a proponent of this project. I know I, you, you know that. I know. You know, matter of fact, five, not five only was I a proponent, were, but I was so a yeah. large proponent. And you know the reason I was. The same reason I am today, for downtown renovation, and that's why I agree with this particular site. Um, however, you know, and I have no problem with phase two at all. The only problem I have at this stage of the game is a problem with the city putting money into it. I, I, I commend our delegate for doing this. And I think if it's short a insignificant degree that we need to be looking at our private partners and our county partners. Am I saying I would never put any money into that additional? I don't know. I'll never say never, but I'll say never if we're the only other funding source other than the state. Because that's just to me another indication that we, you know, candidly, I'd like to see stakeholders as people willing to put some money in, and there are some people at this table who are willing to do that. So I don't mean to imply that there are not. Okay. Um, but so I, I express to you my support and my concern that I don't know. And when we talk about the other stadiums, I want to point out Frank Perdue, Cal Ripken, uh, they all were funded that way. Um, I don't know how Potomac got funded. Does anybody know where the private money came from down there? For Fredericksburg's, the, the, the move to Fredericksburg? They, I'm sorry, I really wonder where Waldorf. they moved. Okay, they, well, they, they are. I mean, Fredericksburg is, they're building a stadium at Fredericksburg. Okay, they're the ones Nationals. doing the long-term lease, right? He's they're front, fronting the money or how Yeah, the, the, the city's money. giving them a million right. something yeah. right, a year. Okay. So that, that's my feelings about gotcha. it. Can I address that? Of one third private sector, so that is that is the rule of thumb. It's not statute. It's what a lot of communities uh, target. Senator Serafini made it clear that that was yeah. how he saw it. And the stadium authority wants that. Right. I mean, that's that's what they're telling me. But I've I've chronicled the last 22 ballparks built and how much they cost and what was the private share, what was the public share, and how was the public share funded. And it is all over the map. So every town does it the way it best suits them. Um, without, like, 
before a lease is negotiated, it's hard to talk about figures because that is a really indication of what your target is. But the private sector money doesn't come from donations or, or investments in the ballpark. It comes from a, a 30 year lease which transfers from owner to owner. So I've lived to about five ownership groups since I've moved to Hagerstown and became a Suns fan. So who owns the team is insignificant to me. The fact that they have a 30 year lease tied to this new facility is our goal. Now you take that lease money and a portion of the naming rights and over a period of 30 years that becomes one third of the project cost. Uh, exactly. So how does the local business community support the ballpark? They rent the luxury suites. They buy advertising on the outfield wall. They buy a block of season tickets for their staff and, and to entertain their clients. That's how the business community supports uh, the ballpark. The third private sector is fully from the lease and a portion of the naming rights. So I'm doing a little survey around minor leagues right now. What could you get for naming rights in the Hagerstown market? All right, 300 to 500,000 annually is what I'm being told. And I didn't believe it. Uh, if you want 500,000, then you got to give a lot. Luxury suite, certain amount of tickets, uh, exclusive naming rights. If you want 300,000, all those other revenue sources are available to split with the ownership or to have for the city. I never thought it would be that high, and I'm, I mean, my sample size is like that big, so I'm still working on that. But I'm encouraged that we could at least pull 100,000 a year out of a naming rights deal to go to a debt service, and the ownership group makes up the rest. When, when you're doing this, Dan, did you also try to see what interest there would be in the business community to season tickets, to sky suites, things of that nature? I mean, I'd be very, those, mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that would be helpful to me to hear that not only these things that could be done, but we have businesses that are saying, if you built that stadium, we would do it. I'm not asking people to sign a contract committing to it, but I am interested to hear from those folks, wh whether it be, you know, City Corp or Volvo or, or whoever it would be uh, of an interest. So. The advice I'm getting on naming rights is you go with a national company that has a regional presence. Don't go to a local company. They can't afford that. B, B, and T Bank, uh, Columbia Gas, First Data. Um, so no, I, I haven't probed in, into that yet. No, I understand. Who's going to raise their hand and buy? We're going to build six suites, not 16. Right. You know, it, it, and that, and a block of season tickets. Uh, those are the types of things we can start rallying people behind. Now, we were focusing more on the collateral investment Understood. because what we've targeted at $53 million in new investment and new property assessment, it'll offset the city's cost for the debt service. But my goal for the city and the county would be to pay for this debt service outside of property taxes because that's the thing that the municipal and county governments covet the most. Don't give it away on a TIF district. Keep it for yourself. So you shift the debt service off to amusement taxes, lodging taxes, and things like that, so that when the property assessments come rising up, money floods into the city's coffers and the county coffers to, to, play, to pay police and fire and rescue service and provide social services and, and rec and parks and make investments in the communities of will, goodwill the other way. That, that's kind of my personal goal for the funding model. Um, I think we can achieve that because we have a really robust lodging industry here, and that's a strong fund. And the city county third of a share financed over 30 years is not going to be prohibitively large. It's a, it's a rather small amount in the scheme of a $240 million annual budget. It's a very small thing in the scheme of a state budget. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of my, my reason for that. I, I just want the city and the county to benefit in their general fund from this and not to give that away uh, to offset the debt service. Because then you're like, oh, look what we accomplished. We're still broke. So. I think that 
think there's one, you know, one more thing I just want to bring up. When you're looking at the state third, you know, we got to think about how do we get, how do we improve our chances of getting that? It's going to be, you know, that's anytime you're going for state money, it's competitive. And, you know, we do not have the political clout of Central Maryland, so we have to really work hard at it. Last time, I can just tell you what happened last time. Last time, one of the ways we won was because this was designated a downtown revitalization project. So we made a big issue over that. When I was commissioner, we downzoned the rural areas. We took a big hit, you know. That, that's not an easy thing to do politically. The Secretary of State, Rich Hall at the time, he was Secretary of Planning for the, for the town. You know, I contacted Rich Hall and said, Rich, you know, we, we downzoned the county. We did what you wanted to do to try to help, you know, drive growth to the urban areas. But you're going to have to support us building infrastructure in the urban areas to try to take care of that growth. You got to support the counties that actually bit the bullet and made those decisions and made that happen. You know, he was a big proponent of what we were trying to do because it was down the core. And he talked to the capital budget senior person for Governor O'Malley at the time, who was right across the hall to say, hey, what these guys are doing downtown is important. We got to get behind this project. We got to give you state funding. That's what helped us get that state $10 million. And if you talk to some of the uh, delegates back then or, or senators, they'll tell you that that money was had. You know, now people need to understand how that works in the capital budget. You go that you go and ask in the summer. I think in September it was Mayor Brucci, the former head of the Chamber of Commerce, Joe Frick. Uh, and the coalition's lobbyists all went down. We met with the senior person for capital budget. We made our plea. They used September, October to kind of sort out and who rises to the top. November, December, they start kicking around internally, throwing in the political aspects to this. Hey, which county do you want to give more money to, whatever? And they make decisions and kind of tell you that behind the scenes. It's not something they take headlines out on and say, hey, we're giving you the money because they reserve the right to change anything up until the capital budget comes out in January. We had all the right feedback then, but then we had some changes in decisions on whether or not to move forward. And then the comments we got was, hey, we're pulling that back. Obviously, you guys are still thinking about this project. We're pulling that away this year. Talk to us again, and we'd have to restart the process next year. <coughs> So as you're moving forward to make a decision on which project you or which area you want to go, think about that because that is a third of the money. And, and Maryland is one of the few states that actually puts writes a check for for sports stadiums. So you know, will they support it other places? Possibly. I don't want to say they wouldn't. You know, we certainly could make an effort, but that was the part that pushed us over the hill that got a Democratic governor in a Republican county, and I'm not saying for politics, I'm saying for votes. You know, I don't know how many votes he got in Washington County, but it was probably, what, 20%, 25% versus the other way. So that's not easy politically to walk down for that. But we were able to win that because of a downtown revitalization park project. The chair of appropriations is Delegate McIntosh. She's out of Baltimore. She has keen knowledge of what stadiums do to cores. You know, that helped us. You know, and she will most likely be chair appropriations again this year. So those are things to consider, you know, as you're making that decision, is what's going to give us the best chance of getting that money. So just put that out there as well. So <clears throat> one of the things that occurred back in 2012 when, uh, when a number of us uh, took office after that uh, election and, and the, the, that initial stadium proposal sort of uh, fizzled out, was each of us were given sort of all of the documentation uh, that that folks weren't given uh, to a large degree during those deliberations. And at that time, uh, I said two things during that election process. One was I'm not really pro or anti-baseball. I don't have any great affinity or, or opposition uh, to the sport or to having the amenity. Um, and, and two, uh, we had spent uh, about the last 10 years investing more than $60 million uh, into the arts and, and entertainment and education themes uh, for downtown, and we were starting to reap some of the fruits of that uh, investment, and I felt that that was the appropriate theme and course uh, to continue uh, for the city, and those were, were sort of very two simple points that I made um, uh, in that election process. and and. 
So uh, uh, sometime before, you know, we were actually sort of sworn into office, uh, we were given sort of all the information. And, and you know, at that point, you're able to uh, digest uh, the, the uh, communications and, and dialogue uh, and, and, and facts and figures uh, that, that had occurred. You know, and, and we talk about, you know, this, this needs to be more than, 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 than just for uh, baseball. And so, you know, uh, in, in part of that, the, those lease uh, agreement uh, outlines, you know, things stuck out to me, such as the city gets to use all or part of the music free of charge for 10 events per year and gets to keep the proceeds. And those events have to be one day events between March and March 1st and September 30th. Uh, and otherwise, uh, uh, the events are, are managed through the Suns. Uh, they, they have a surcharge on tickets. Um, uh, Ten of the 12 uh, private suites would be owned and retained for the sole use and proprietorship of the Suns. All of this 100 uh, uh, um, or 75 or 125 parking spaces, VIP spaces, would, would be owned and retained and, and marketed uh, at the sole discretion of the Suns. And so you go through, and there's about 30 items here. A few of which I would say favor uh, the the initiative of the city being uh, the debt burden holder uh, of that, and, and it was actually a 20-year uh, lease term with uh, possibility of renewal, uh, not a 30. Uh, one of the other documents that we received uh, at that time were the uh, uh, the negotiations for acquisition of property, and I know the mayor mentioned the laundromat at that time. Uh, the offer was about 365,000. The owner wanted about 600,000. Uh, uh, the uh, offer for the Harold Mail property was about 1.2 million, um, and uh, the Harold Mail's response was they're going to get their own appraisal. And so I hear these notions that, that, that these things are sort of, you know, ironed out, and, and, and you read a different story when you actually get to read the documentation. And, and you know, that's really our job up here. You know, it's certainly not the public's to digest this information and, and sort of make informed decisions, it, it, it's really ours to do. Uh, one of the things uh, that we also received uh, uh, well after uh, uh, the project and, and the election had, um, you know, uh, uh, ran its course, uh, was about six months uh, into the term, uh, we received uh, the phase two environmental report uh, for the property. And, you know, uh, fortunately, working in the public sector, I get to see some of these things from time to time, and and so uh, Jim probably recalls when uh, you know we were uh, commissioners and and asked to entertain the thought and possibility of of, of buying uh, a, a property uh, in Williamsport uh, that that you know we had some environmental concerns about, and uh, you know when when you read a report, uh, the groundwater report. So what they did is they dug 24 test holes. Uh, of the property that we're talking about, the Baltimore Street, and you know there there are 24, 25 different contaminants found, and, and you see diesel components and, and the MD standards about 47 parts per million, I believe it is, and you read that that this site, one of the groundwater uh, test uh, locations, was 45,000 uh, parts per million, and those types of things, obviously, uh, uh, in in concert. Of, of the total package of uh, the property acquisition, uh, uh, the environmental uh, uh, conditions, uh, uh, the terms with the prospective uh, tenant, and uh, and I won't go into to some of the funding uh, uh, outlines uh, that were included. Uh, they give you some pause and, and some calls for uh, concern, and 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 it did, and, and that that's just. You know, that's just uh, an analysis that I would do uh, within my own mind uh, as part of any deliberation of any uh, item or activity or project I'm being asked to consider uh, on behalf of the public. And uh, sometime shortly thereafter, uh, late 2013, we had the same uh, entity come back and sort of uh, do a, a, we'll call it a re-report uh, with further considerations, uh, and I believe at that time, you know, hospital Hill, as it's commonly referred to, was, was you know, sort of on the table and, and uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, at the end of that process, you know, that uh, became, uh, for a very short uh, moment, you know, the, the, the area of, of, of consideration. And uh, part of that study, and, and 
and this gets the, to, to the point that I have, uh, part of that study outlined uh, a stadium uh, adjacent to the existing stadium location. And it was a small part uh, of, of that uh, 2013 report uh, by uh, Ripken Design again. And some of the things uh, within that uh, additional report caught my eye, and, and, and this is one of those areas. Uh, and so I tried to take the new report that we received from uh, Crossroads Consulting and, 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 and the Populous uh, Matrix, and I'm still not sure how those numbers were uh, configured uh, on the point scale. Uh, but I tried to take some, some of those uh, uh, items, just as I did in that last iteration back uh, those number of years ago, and uh, talk about property cost. Uh, you know, 2012, uh, the Baltimore Street property was at about $6.5 million of projected acquisition uh, cost component. Uh, the area uh, adjacent to the existing stadium uh, is less than a million dollars. And so right there for me, I have to look at that and say, okay, that's about a five to six million dollar swing uh, just on property uh, acquisition cost alone. And a couple of other things associated with that property cost uh, is uh, in that time, there have been more than $5 million, more than $5 million in public and private investment in the Baltimore Street property area between uh, uh, the car wash, the county, the, the, uh, the Harold Mill building, um, and uh, uh, the Cultural Arts Trail. Uh, there's been zero investment uh, in those properties adjacent to the current uh, stadium site. Uh, zero. And so, uh, the second item associated with property cost uh, and investment and location is for about six or seven million dollars, uh, we get about a six acre site that we possibly can fit a stadium on uh, based on a specific configuration that's different than the configuration of the other seven locations um, looked at uh, versus for less than a million dollars, we get more than 20 acres, I believe, in total of uh, the property uh, that's adjacent to the current stadium site. And that's simply because the city owns you know, about 70% of that total property. Um, and so that was one thing. Uh, the second was obviously the environmental constraint. Like I said, you know, when, when, when I see that, and I didn't see it added into the project uh, cost scope, um, but, but you know, when you're hitting groundwater at six and 12 and 18 feet, uh, number one, and you're finding those uh, levels of contaminants, uh, and, and let's face it, you know, you're, you're putting it on a property that uh, was, you know, was an intensively used rail yard at one time, and it's now basically a big parking lot. And so I have to, to, to question, you know, once you make that endeavor, what's the cost equation uh, environmentally to address the conditions of that property? Um, and uh, the third item uh, speaks to, to Lou's comment about county support. Uh, uh, the property adjacent to the current stadium, I don't need to ask the county uh, to figure out how they're going to uh, up and uh, move away from a $1.6 million investment uh, in, in uh, a current administrative bu administration building that they have now uh, and, and, and you know, move and find and, and, and expend that funding for relocation elsewhere. Um, I think they bought that property for about 330000 and they put about 840000 into it by the time I left county office. Uh, the fourth item, as I mentioned, uh, was just the sheer acreage. If you're telling me I get 20 acres to develop uh, for this type of project uh, versus six, uh, and I can do it at about 15% of the property acquisition cost, that, that's a big deal. Um, the, uh, the next item uh, was the Urban Partners Plan. So there's, there, there's eight projects listed in the Urban Partners Plan, which we've uh, been attempting to follow. Uh, none of those eight projects include a stadium, but they do t include two other things. One is a Class A office space, and the other is a convention uh, uh, facility. And uh, I've taken some folks up, and I've shown some folks, and I will tell you, uh, you know, the possibility of putting some type of office complex on Hospital Hill that has that view down into a stadium, to me, is, is a fairly sort of visionary thing. Uh, and you really have to, to go up and see it to, to sort of understand that. 
and then to be able to provide that linkage um, uh, to a place uh, uh, within that vicinity because there's about, I don't know, 100 acres uh, worth of, of, of uh, varying type of, of office and, and, and uh, uh, hospitality facilities. Uh, Venice comes to mind uh, in that immediate vicinity, uh, which gets me to uh, the next point. And we talk about, you know, uh, the Dagmar is a boutique hotel. If we're doing this to fix the problems at the Dagmar, we could all probably save a lot of money and just buy and mothball the Dagmar. Uh, but we have other real problems, as you well know, of our hotels along the Dual Highway. And putting that stadium at that location immediately provides opportunity uh, for an influx of patronage to uh, boost uh, the marketability of uh, about three or four hotels uh, along uh, that stretch of the Dual Highway in the immediate vicinity from the Days Inn up to, to, to the Venice Inn and those areas in between. And we've certainly discussed at this table uh, those problems that those hotels uh, have, have uh, you know, uh, uh, posited. The, uh, the other item that, that, that uh, caught my interest, and what I'd like to do, I'm a, I'm a visual person, you're free to pass these around. You can certainly uh, throw them in the trash when we leave here. Um, but it just gives you an idea, uh, and, and you know, I got kind of tired of hearing uh, over the last several months, you know, I'm simply opposed to a stadium, uh, and I'm not opposed, uh, uh, you know, on, on face value. Uh, I just have a different idea, you know, about what that looks like. And I don't buy into this notion that uh, downtown consists of simply four blocks uh, of downtown. Uh, there's about 20 blocks in downtown that make up downtown that we have to uh, achieve some, some sort of rounded uh, investment in. And so it just gives you an idea and the reason I pass this around is because it immediately provides about a four acre park amenity uh, to a location such as that without having to do much at all except add that park amenity to uh, this type of venue, providing that opportunity for events other than uh, uh, baseball. Uh, the other thing it does is everybody's heard about the MS4 uh, uh, mandate. Uh, we've got to fix our stormwater management structures. Uh, we've got to do retrofits. And we've also heard uh, time and again about flooding issues at this area. Uh, here we have the opportunity to use both stormwater management fees and federal tax credits to invest in uh, retrofit of the creek, uh, the culverted area along this stretch uh, and, and address that with funding that isn't general fund money. Uh, uh, the next item, when I looked at the two sites, and frankly, uh, you know, half a dozen of those sites, there is no better site on that paper that we received for accessibility than this location. There are dualized roads, there are two-way streets that go in and out of this. When I looked at the traffic ass assessment report for the Baltimore Street property, there was at least one intersection that would go to a level F, and at least a number of intersections on one-way streets at times would be level D. And that's just with, that's just with the vehicular activity back in 2012 before we did anything else downtown at that time for those periods. Uh, now it's clearly a different picture. Um, uh, the other, uh, uh, the other uh, item that I looked at is, you know, we talk about and, and uh, you know, the opportunity for private business. You know, I, I got an email from, from the owner of Stadium Tavern, you know, and said, hey, you know, this, this is gonna have an impact if, if there's a different, uh, uh, you know, direction. And I said, you know, we could situate this in a manner that actually brings that business uh, uh, into uh, the uh, proximity of that type of facility and provides uh, a natural sort of creek uh, a feature uh, tied into that business yeah, and tied into the stadium. Um, and uh, uh, we also talked about the issue associated with residential uh, homes. I will tell you a couple of things. Uh, this area is located within what we would generally call the Bester uh, residential area. Uh, the Bester residential area, if you look at the census, city census tracts, you'll see two things. One is there's approximately 11 to 12 percent home ownership in what we call sort of the Bester census area tract. The second is uh, there's about 75 percent subsidized housing for different types of, uh, of housing in that same census tract. And there's over 400 residential properties 
uh, in the vicinity of this particular location that could certainly stand that same level of economic benefit and build up uh, the residential uh, stability uh, that, that some at this table have, have talked about. Uh, the other thing, it doesn't disrupt uh, the efforts that, that we have made uh, on, uh, on the A&E. And so, you know, while I couldn't get a map for it, uh, you know, I tried to figure out uh, physically uh, by looking at what the proposal was because the proposal on the eight sites and the final site design that we received for Baltimore Street, the stadium is configured differently. And so I didn't realize that until you, you look at the, the, the two differentiations between the report and, and what was proposed uh, in the analysis. And so I just simply, you're welcome to, to, to pass this around, you can see the overlay of what it means. Uh, because you can see the Google Earth uh, overview of where it's at and you can see what the stadium will look like once it's, once it's superimposed on it. And that brings me to the question I think that Emily uh, uh, raised, which is we have, I'm going to, uh, um, uh, probably speak out a little here. We have uh, tax exempt bond financing associated with the improvements and investments that we've made in the cultural trail uh, to the tune of almost $2 million. And I don't know the ramifications uh, of what that means of, of removing that uh, from uh, what has been invested there uh, as it applies to the remaining term that we have on those bonds and whether we would have to go to a taxable uh, bond structure because now we are entering into it with a private party. Uh, I've done that on at least one other occasion with another jurisdiction and I'm familiar that that, that would uh, likely be a, you know, a very possible uh, um, outcome and, and I don't know what the financial ramifications uh, of that mean. And <clears throat> the last thing I'll say, and, and you know, this is probably a little bit of, of, I don't know, I'll call it the con, you know, I just gave you the pros of why why I've sort of reached where I'm at, but I'll give you the con, is you know, what do you do with the light department? Because uh, this would obviously have an impact, uh, but two good things from that. One is, that's an impact to a city departmental function, which means we don't have to ask another governmental entity uh, to be impacted by the decision we make. Uh, and and uh, we have talked, uh, I think, at length through this administration as well as a prior administration of uh, the possibility of looking at consolidated uh, city services uh, in, in sort of a central maintenance facility. Uh, and notably, we've talked about that at a place like the uh, old paper recycling uh, uh, plant. And to me, that's a very viable use uh, of relocation uh, that not only ties in to a project like this at that location with that amount of acreage, uh, but also then ties into the efforts that we made with the removal of MELP and uh, restoration of, uh, of the creek there and provides uh, those parking amenities uh, at a uh, much less cost for that type of amenity feature uh, than it would uh, elsewhere on a more constricted site. And so, you know, I certainly haven't sat through these deliberations uh, the, the number of times that Lou has, uh, but we've had consultant after consultant say, it should be out on 81. It should be over on Basel Boulevard. It should be on Baltimore Street. It should be, you know, where the, where, where, where the stadium is now. And, and I've just had to sit and look and say, okay, if we want to keep it in town, if we want to keep the cost down, you know, if we want to provide those amenities uh, and, and we want to do it in a manner that, that, that ties in uh, to redevelopment opportunity uh, and, and provides accessibility and, and, you know, all those sort of check the boxes types of things that we've talked about through every iteration of every location uh, that we've discussed and we say, you know, it must be done in a, a manner that benefits the city. For me, this is the site. And it's not that I think that, that, that all, you know, all those other sites are untenable. It just means for me that after having uh, the, the, the uh, opportunity to evaluate all of the information, this is the one that makes sense uh, in my mind. Uh, I think that it's, I think it's uh, more publicly supportable. I think it's more uh, politically uh, palatable. Uh, to the various parties, uh, and I think that it provides uh, uh, equally uh, um, the same uh, level of economic impact uh, to, to uh, the city's urban area uh, that, that, that other, other locations would. But if there are three that, that, that are interested in, in Baltimore Street, uh, uh, you know, or some other site, 
I understand the dynamics, the way this five-person uh, five uh, body works. Uh, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to pursue that location and, and you know, do so at, at the will of the majority. Well, I think <clears throat> Council Nashar brings up a good point in, in along the lines of what Council Member uh, Keller said at the beginning as far as the vision of the city and where we want to go as a city. And it seems from the discussion I've heard so far from most of the members here, it seems to be that there is support for a facility. The question really comes down to as far as potentially where that facility may be. I mean, Council Member Ressler was very clear, and I appreciate his comments earlier. Um, the Council Member Ressler was just as clear as a moment ago. But I think what we all have to look at in the conversation that, that uh, Council Member Keller started out with is, what's the vision? And where do we want to see ourselves five years, 10 years, 20 years from now? And you can make an argument for any one of these sites one way or another. I'm not an expert in, in site analysis. You know, the Maryland State Authority did their analysis, the Ripken State did their, did their analysis. You know, we have downtown sites that have been identified for opportunity zones. There are a lot uh, of individuals have gone in to indicate uh, what zones are ripe for reinvestment and opportunities, whether it's the state, the federal government. Uh, you know, the governor's talked at length about opportunity zones. Congressman Trum was here last week and twice mentioned opportunity zones. You know, we can, we can put a facility at any one of these eight sites and you'll get something out of it. The question is, what is it that you want to get out of it? Do you want to have a facility where you drive up, you park, you go to a game, you leave, and you go to a hotel? You can have that facility at the current site, sure. Do you want a site downtown where you're going to force people to come out on the streets of Hagerstown? You're going to force 200, 300, 400,000, how many people it is to come to our core and walk through the core of downtown Hagerstown to spur that investment that we so desperately need. This is so much bigger than a stadium. We keep talking about stadium, but what really comes down to, I think, um, uh, Paul said this earlier, and, and Jim alluded to it, is the urban improvement project that we're currently on. Okay, we have the urban improvement project. What's going to be next? Whether it's urban improvement project 2.0, you want to call it whatever it may be, but it's something that's going to be a combination of public-private investment to continue the momentum downtown. Without that, you know, you know, we're going to be sitting in here like, you know, Councilman Messner has been and Mayor Brucci for the last 20 years and talk about this for the next 10 or 20 years, you know? We know what our downtown looks like without an urban improvement project opposed to what this could be. We know what that is, we're, we're living it, you know? The question is, do we want to see what the possibility is in the future of having something um, would have the magnitude to transcend everything that, that is going on here uh, right now, you know? I went back and looked at a few things, you know, through the Herald Mail, and, you know, you can find a lot when you're reading this, and a lot of it goes when we're talking about, you know, site selection, location, things of that nature. And, you know, a couple of things I just want to point out here real quick from the articles that I read here. I don't want to come downtown and leave there at night with all the weirdos. So leave it alone, put it out on I-70 where it belongs. I hope they don't put this downtown. Not once I've ever seen police, and I sure do wonder about the security in downtown Hagerstown. Hagerstown resident Roy Funk spoke out against taxpayers having little say in where their money is spent, including proposed downtown projects, the taxpayers not being represented. This is not about a stadium. It's not about an improvement project that we're talking about here now. This is what Councilman Messner alluded to earlier. This was about the university system of Maryland 20 years ago. Okay? This is the same discussions that were had 20 years ago, the same discussions that we're having now, but where the best place is to put a facility, the best place to put a project that can really help influx in, and change the trajectory of our town you know, going forward. Tim Rowland wrote an article at the same time I remember it's Tim Rowland. This last sentence was 20 years from now, the governor's decision will be seen either as bold or creative or crazy and pigheaded. Time will tell. So we're here 20 years now after the university system of Maryland. I don't think anyone at this table would argue that that was an incorrect decision. But you go back 20 years ago, the entire Washington County delegation was against putting that university downtown. All the stakeholders wanted it out in either Allegheny, uh, the Allegheny plant, uh, property out on 70, or then to Hagerstown Community College there towards the end. It came downtown. You could argue without that, obviously you wouldn't have this, this university itself. Barbara Ingram may not be here. We definitely wouldn't have the urban improvement project that I have going on right now. And what's happened over the last 20 years, how downtown has, has changed from what it was then to what it is now, you know, Again, we, we know what our downtown looks like without having a project of this magnitude. So the decision is up to you guys as far as what the location. I mean, it sounds to me, again, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but from the discussion header, there seems to be a majority consensus of looking into the possibility of a project. It seems to maybe possibly be the location. So, I mean, again, that's the decision you guys have to make, but don't, I would, I would caution 
you know, being concerned about, you know, where that location may be and then how it's going to transcend you know, over time. We, we, we've seen this movie, you know, 20 years ago. And again, I don't think anyone would disagree with how that has worked out and where we are now. So, um, again, it's your guys' decision, but I, I go back to the original question that Councilmember Keller answered, and I haven't heard it completely from everyone now, of what your vision of downtown is. And whether you're going to talk about this evening, that's fine, or, or next week, and whenever you guys are going to reconvene, because there's no pressure on this either. I don't think that we need to rush into this, like Councilman Keller said, as far as have to have a decision tonight by any means. You know, when Maryland Stadium Authority was here, the money would be released for phase two in July. They even indicated they probably wouldn't start it till the fall. So when you talk about doing things, you know, differently, so we don't fall back to the same way that we've done before, by all means, do, do your due diligence, that whatever you feel is needed. But you know, to, to sit here and, and talk about things that are the same breath about what happened in 2012 and how you know all these amenities were geared towards the team. Well, this isn't 2012. This is 2019. All right, things are different. It's a different aspect of where the team situation is. There's a different aspect of where our community is. There's different people at this table here today. So um, I am more than happy to lend my support to whatever direction you guys decide to go in. Um, ultimately, it's, it's, it's your decision as far as moving forward as from a city initiative. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I appreciate you guys doing your due diligence uh, with this project. Thank you. Anybody else at the table want to say anything? I, I just want to go back to the current location and then what Kristen brought up. I mean, I don't think this is a horrible idea, and I think he raises some good points. And I, I um, talked to the deputy mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana earlier today about their downtown stadium i'm pretty sure you wrote the script for him to read because he sounded an awful lot like know, you I've been repeating um, his words. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um you know their downtown stadium is not downtown like the baltimore street location it's about the same distance as this general area where it's at now and he said that what happened there was the growth experience went from just being right downtown like we're experiencing the whole way to the ballpark i mean that to me is interesting when we're looking at what we want to do like yes we want a stadium an event center whatever we're going to call it do we put it right on baltimore street where things are already happening or do we put it a little further away and have growth because Hagerstown is bigger than the square i mean we constantly talk about the square and what's happening in the arts and entertainment district but it is Hagerstown needs developed all over. Um, and I think, yes, opportunity zones are extremely important, but does this, does putting a location such as this, or you know, even Hospital Hill, which I know is in, in the picture, but does that growth then go from just downtown Hagerstown the whole way? Because that's what they experience there. And that, that would be a good thing, in my opinion. So what's happening in the Baltimore Street area now? I mean, you said that there's I mean, all that's stuff It's very close there. to, the urban improvement project. But what's happening there? What? Nothing is happening at the Baltimore Street area is what I'm saying. Well, there's saying. businesses there now. And a you county have a county building. office building that doesn't pay taxes. Right. You have right, uh, that a we car have to wash buy. that I read you an email from. <laughs> you have, have to buy. properties across the street uh, on, on Baltimore Street that pay a pilot. You, you have, uh, uh, I mean, there's the possibility of great things that can happen from Baltimore Street the whole way down Memorial Boulevard if you place one in that area. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you guys, the last administration talked about that. And, you know, again, the urban improvement or, or, or the uh, urban partners plan, uh, the eight point plan that Kristen alluded to, uh, I, I, a class A office space was talked about, it was talked about on the central, on, on the Elizabeth Hager lot wasn't talked about on Hospital Hill. Uh, there's, there's residential along that cultural path that runs from Baltimore Street to Lee Street, all property that is not owned by the city of Hagerstown, that's owned by other entities. You know, but we built the cultural trail anyway. So I, you know, I don't understand why, it, I'm not saying that Christmas plan is a bad plan. I'm not saying that at all. You know, but again, we don't even know, you know, what if uh, we looked at that as phase two and we did a study on that as phase two? 
what happens to HDLP? You know, what, what happens over there in the central maintenance garage? Where do they go? You know, do they go across the street to the green machine? You know, uh, you know, we got to buy that, we got to tear it down, we got to refab it, or whatever we got to do. What does that cost? So, you know, I mean, you heard from the business community, you heard from the people who, the stakeholders, who say, you know, this is a good, a good spot on Baltimore, but again, it's up to you guys to make that decision. You five have to decide where you want to focus on and where you want to spend phase two money at. Are we able to add Kristen's idea site to phase two in order to announce? I'm sure it's going to double the price, but sure. Yeah, we're trying to bring phase two to a certain percentage of like drawings. I don't want to go through phase two and just have a glossy image that everyone gets inspired by. I want to have some legitimate engineering. I want to have some legitimate uh, architectural, you know, space in it. I, I want that to be part of the design project so we don't have to spend our money again. Um, when, when I was prepping to interview for the job I have now, I went to see John Fiesler, who has my job in Frederick, and I asked him, what is Frederick's number one tourist attraction? And I thought he was going to say Monocacy Battlefield or the religious sites up along Route 15. He said, it's the urban experience. I said, oh, you mean Carroll Creek? He said, no, it's the whole urban experience. That's what brings people out of Rockville and Bethesda up, up into Frederick for a night out. Um, Frederick wishes it had its ballpark there on Carroll Creek. It's only a mile away. Um, I agree with what, what Jim said earlier. Uh, don't dilute the investment. Go for a critical mass downtown. And, and as you advance through this battlefield of uh, economic development, don't leave a pocket of enemies in your rear. Don't leave a rotting city core, you know, and, and have a, a half of an East End project, too. I, I just don't think the East End project is as sexy as the downtown project. And because of that, I don't think it'll do as well. Uh, and, and I don't think it'll fix all the things that, that we need to fix in our downtown core. And I don't think it'll create that urban experience that we're looking for. Um, city park and garages are empty after 5 o'clock. When that ballpark is downtown, they'll be full after 5 o'clock. Think about how much revenue will flow into your parking fund because the ballpark's downtown. A lot. A lot of money coming in. Do you want to justify a third deck? You're going to need it anyway. Do you want the full force and power of the stadium there? Or do you want to build it independent of that and, and try to find a way to finance it? Make it part of this, part of this bigger project. And uh, I don't want to get too preachy, but we're going to build a ballpark downtown, not because it's easy or cheap, but because it's hard and because it's the right thing to do. A dollar in, two dollars out on the east end, or 10 in and 10 out downtown. I, mean, I, I think it's all, all in on the downtown site. Uh, as tourism director, I'm going to win either way. You could build this in Williamsport, and I would win. Build it in Hancock, my gosh, they could use a boost. But as a citizen and a taxpayer and a property owner in this city, I want to see it. I want to see it downtown. I think that um, yeah, and I may be looking at this totally different than anybody else. Maybe I'm a weirdo, but. Oh, you're definitely a weirdo. I know I'm a weirdo. I, I admit, I'm the first to admit. I, well, I we do love things. It. I fly upside down sometimes because I'm like, <laughs> it. Um, you know, we keep coming back to the, the the baseball field, and yet everybody everybody here tonight has spoken about this as a multi-use facility, an event center, a, 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 a multi-use complex of some sort. I, my view of downtown Hagerstown is the, the best thing that we have going for us downtown right now is the influx of the university traffic. The, the, the educational institutions are coming in right now. You look at any other city anywhere in this country, when you've got an educational institution downtown, you've got continuous turnover. You've got parents coming in. You've got students coming in. You've got students going to dinner, parents taking students to dinner constant influx in and out in and out movement of people and then everything builds up around there and, and this downtown facility is 
that's something that should be and can be part of this. I mean, the, the, the multi-use complex down there, I, I see it being a, an enabler for BISFA to have performances outside at night. I see the Maryland Symphony having the symphony under the stars at night. I see Shakespeare under the stars. There's all kinds of things that can happen in this downtown event center other than baseball. And, and everybody, we keep coming back to baseball diamond, baseball diamond. Base I don't see that as being the big draw. I just don't. I, I think that what we're talking about here is a, a multi-use facility to get traffic downtown. And I think if, if we can, I mean, why wouldn't, why wouldn't the educational institutions have their commencement ceremonies there? If we ever put the Blues Fest back on again, why wouldn't it be there? If we continue to do Imagine Hagerstown, why isn't that the place where we'd have it? I, this is just a, a spot to bring all this traffic downtown. If you never build a baseball diamond, I don't care. But let's put some kind of a, a catalyst downtown to bring that traffic. I don't care what kind of traffic it is. And that, again, maybe I'm weird looking at it that way, but that's my feeling. I think we need something downtown. But I think that the partnership with a baseball team seems to add to the possibility. So it's it's both. Mm -hmm. if, the way I, if, if, am I correct? No, so minor league baseball is family entertainment. Don't confuse it with sports. Um, and then a, a stadium properly designed is a performance venue. For, for, for concerts and shows, just like you described. It's also your anchor point for fairs and festivals. You open the gate, you have restrooms for 5,000 people. Think about staging a 5K race at the plaza of the stadium and having food, beverage, first aid, and restrooms for all your participants just by opening the gate. So, oh, it's in the A&E district. So any performance in that district is subjected to the tax breaks that the A and E district brings to performers. So imagine trying to bring into Hagerstown a big national act. And when their when their promoter and manager look at it, they go like, we don't have to pay any taxes on this. State taxes. You don't have to pay state taxes on this performance. Uh, you move it outside the A and E district, you don't get that. You move it outside the opportunity zone, you put Delta Quarter Minute on in a hard situation getting that state's third. That's I, I, I think that I think that the downtown site just complements the education hub and the A and E theme. When you talk about other than baseball, um, and, and and let's talk about other than minor league baseball. Because minor league baseball would be the anchor tenant that pays right. the, majority the majority of the bills. cost. That that's what minor league baseball yeah. would be. You got Dr. Clower who was here, and he's, I, I see he's gone now. Scott Jennings coaches the Hagerstown Community College baseball team. I've had conversations with him. Uh, uh, to be totally upfront, we're childhood friends, all right, so we can talk plainly to each other. They play 13 home games a year. They would play 13 home games at this new facility. You have uh, people talk about girls softball tournaments. They're pretty big. They're pretty huge, all right? So you put a girls softball tournament that can go on over to fairgrounds and then have the championship game downtown, huge, huge. You would bring the South Atlantic League All-Star game to Hagerstown, Maryland. Yeah. Something we've never had and have never hosted. And those are teams from all over the South, America, or, or South Atlantic League. So there, there's, besides just minor league baseball games, there's another 50 sports venues that can be played at that facility to enhance what happens there now. Then you add on those extra hundred events, whatever they are, and you have people in the core of downtown of Hagerstown constantly walking through. Imagine what, just imagine, the setup that we have right now with the restaurants that we have and, well, restaurants that we have. Imagine an extra thousand people seven nights in a row. What that would do just for those restaurants, just a thousand. A thousand that we don't get now. 
I, I mean, I, you know, I see this differently, and I know that, you know, uh, uh, Christians talk about, you know, uh, things of, about the lease from 2012. Just so you know, we never did finalize the lease in 2012. Uh, we could never get together to make that happen. Lou knows all the many, 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 many meetings that we had about a lease, all right? But a 30-year lease signed by a minor league baseball team is huge. 30 years is huge because now you're guaranteed to have a minor league baseball team in that facility for 30 years. It may not be the Suns. It, it, may, be, it may not be a Nationals affiliate. It may be another affiliate. But the point is you will always have a minor league baseball team in that facility for 30 years, guaranteed, to follow that lease that, that was agreed to, let's just say, a year from now. So you always have it. All right. Anybody else have anything else to wrap this up? Uh, because we've got to keep moving. It's 5.40 now. Uh, it's been an hour and 40 minutes on an hour meeting. Everybody knows how much I love that. Uh, so. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Thank you guys very much. We're available to, to reach out to anytime. time. All right, great, great. So I need to get a motion to go into special the 74 special session, please. So moved. <clears throat> get a second. Second. Blue and Shelley discussion. All in favor? Aye. Apparently that's aye. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, approval of, uh, of improvements to Wheaton Park. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move for the approval of $32,940 in community development block grant funds for improvements at Wheaton Park as follows. Purchase of four true bounce basketball poles, backboards, and trims, sports court coating of main basketball court, mural and mid court circle, and three point areas. I authorize staff to complete these improvements to support the Ruth Ann Monroe Summer Basketball League and enhance the aesthetics of the park. Second. Shelly gets that discussion. I just want to recognize Ebony Williams in the audience. Um, worked very hard to um, bring this to our attention, and I again applaud you and Rodney and all the folks that helped you get to here. Um, I really look forward to to watching some basketball. I mean, I probably won't know what's going on, but I will watch it. So, congratulations! I'm excited that we get to do this. It's pathetic. What? I don't know. Don't know. It's very squeaky. It's very squeaky. That's <laughs> only on a hard <laughs> well, Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? <laughs> I mean, can you can you teach her something, please? No, you can. All no, in no. favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Can I just, I know you all are going to approve this, but I, I just want to mention um, what Ebony, what, what her staff is doing um, for kids in this area. Um, I'm, I'm close with, with one of their... I guess you want to call him a client, Sleepy Burnett, and the amount of work that these kids um, have put in with with uh, with Sleepy, uh, Catrice Dixon, Dixon, who I love like a daughter, uh, that's on your staff. That what what you have done with not only the athletic side of things, but with with helping kids and mentoring these kids is fantastic, and I applaud you all for that. And and I love what you're going to do. Uh, with the programs at Wheaton Park, I'll be down there also. Um, but what you're doing with just generally with 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 athletes and how you're making them better people and not just better um, athletes, I can't I can't applaud you enough for that. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Approval of a purchase of new portable radio package for Hagerstown Police Department. Ronnie, please don't leave. I've talked to you before you leave. <laughs> yeah, <it's tough>. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's> try. <laughs> I hereby move for mayor and council approval to purchase a new portable radio package for the Hagerstown Police Department. The radio package will be used to replace HPD's aging radio system and will be purchased from Tactical Public Safety LLC via Washington County Wireless Communications. The total cost for the purchase would be $420,000. $37.65. Tactical Public Safety LLC was awarded Washington County's competitively bid contract number INTG-18-005. Funding will be from a 2019 bond issue. Second. 
Second? Yes. Blue. Blue. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Approval of purchase of 2019 police uniforms. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move for the Mayor and City Mayor and Council approval of the purchase of police uniforms. These uniforms will be purchased from Howard Uniforms, Baltimore, Maryland, for a total of $44,137.88. Howard Uniform won the competitively <coughs> bid City of Baltimore Department of Transportation contract number B5000 4657. Funding will be from HPD's uniform account. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries ratification of emergency procurement emergency of demolition at 5761 East Antietam Street Garage, Hagerstown, Maryland. Make sure that we want to do this, please, before we read the motion. Mr. Mayor, we move for the ratification of an emergency procurement for demolition of 5761 East Antietam Street Garage. The garage is in a state of progressive structural collapse and was deemed to be unstable by a professional engineer. Staff ordered the demolition of the structure to eliminate the threat to public safety. Allegheny Wrecking and Salvage of Hagerstown, Maryland completed the demolition work. The cost of the demolition work performed by Allegheny Wrecking and Salvage was $16,000. The work performed at this property will be paid from the property abatement account. Second. Discussion? No in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, Mr. City Administrator. Just a couple of things, Mayor, I'll be quick. Uh, this is our first weekend coming up for Imagine Hagerstown. Um, just want to remind everybody, Friday night uh, at the University Plaza, uh, the Get Right Band will be playing 6.30 to 9. The fun moves to the Cultural Trail on Saturday with um, a full slate of activities from noon until 5. Go to imaginehagerstown.org for more information, but it really looks it's shaping up to be not only a nice weekend weather-wise, but also uh, a very fun weekend to get out and walk around downtown and, and experience the activities. Also, Fairground Stable Community Yard Sale, 7 o'clock to 2 o'clock on Saturday um, at the stables. A ton of vendors out there to love to have your business. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Uh, Saturday or Friday night, I had the privilege of um, going to Thunder in the Square and selecting the mayor's choice of the best car. Although it was a little controversial because I picked a Corvette and apparently that it's a Chevy and that was wow. like a right what should have been a Ford. Well, I was never, I mean, it was the mayor's choice. Why would I pick a Ford? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, it, it was so neat because it was just the definition of community. There were so many people out and the restaurants were packed. It was, it was really amazing. So um, that was the first opportunity I got to do that. And I applaud Doug, the brainchild of that uh, thunder in the square. It was, it was really nice. So thank you for allowing me to do that. I appreciate it. Glad you had fun. Yes, it was. Luke. Nothing, Mary. Thank you. Austin. I uh, just wanted to say, um, our, uh, you know, I, I hope we all uh, keep in, in our forefront of our mind uh, what happened just recently down in Virginia Beach. I saw, Scott, you were uh, going to start working toward uh, looking at the safety of our employees here in the city. And I think that's, uh, you know, something between you and the chief. If, I, I really think, you know, we've hit a, a point in time in our country now where something's going to happen at some point in time and we need to be ready for it so i applaud you for taking the taking the initiative and and doing that chris and uh, and. Uh, so get out this weekend enjoy uh the beginning of of imagine hagerstown uh friday and saturday and enjoy yourselves and have fun uh and uh we will unfortunately have to meet next Tuesday, uh, three council members and myself, to at least go over the preliminary agenda. We'll keep it very short so we'll be in and out. Uh, and then um, we'll have our regular meeting on the 18th. So thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. We're adjourned.